Good afternoon. I'm Dean Michael Hussey, Dean of the Law School here at Widener Law Commonwealth. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to campus for the inaugural William Strong Lecture on Ethics and the Business Lawyer. Uh, the Business Advising Program is one of our signature programs here at the Law School, along with our Law and Government Institute and our Environmental Law and Sustainability Center. The Business Advising Program works on providing students with a foundational education to be able to represent and be client ready when they graduate, the small and mid-sized businesses that drive the large part of our economy here in the United States. So welcome to all of you. It's great that you're here with us. And now I'd like to introduce Professor, excuse me, Professor Christian Johnson. So about five years ago, I was, I was walking the, the mean streets of Reading, Pennsylvania. And I saw a little marker to Justice William Strong. And I, I thought this was extraordinary that Reading, Pennsylvania has a US Supreme Court justice that, uh, that came from that. And, and the more I read about them, about him, the, the more intrigued I, I became. And uh, he, uh, while he grew up in uh, Connecticut and, and went to Yale Law School, he, for whatever reason, settled down in uh, Reading, Pennsylvania, where he was in private practice and where he became a, uh, a congressman for a period of about four years. And then in uh, 1857, he was appointed to, uh, excuse me, 1847, he was, um, no, no, I'm sorry, I had it right. In 1857, he was appointed to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, where he practiced for 11 years. And coming out and in his private practice, he he probably did all kinds of things, but but he was also clearly a business lawyer. He was on he was on the board of directors for Farmers Bank and the Lebanon Valley Railroad, and and he was counsel for the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad Company, and and did all sorts of of things in the business area. In um, 1869, he was tapped by uh, President Grant to be on the U.S. Supreme Court where he did a, did a terrific job for 10 years and realized at the end of 10 years that he had uh, done his duty and, uh, and retired to uh, giving back to, uh, to New York. Although after passing away, he was interred back in uh, Reading, Pennsylvania. And so I, I just thought, what a wonderful um, example for us that uh, we've got our own Supreme Court justice from uh, from what, what I would I, I would include as, as central Pennsylvania. The Reading people may, may disagree, but I would I would pull that into our clearly our sphere here at the law school. It's an important uh, draw for us. And uh, and we're just thrilled. We've we've wanted to create a signature uh, business ethics uh, lecture series, and uh, and we've we've named it after him. And we are really excited to have Sandra Rocks come and to be our inaugural speaker. And I'm going to turn time out now over to uh, uh, Dean Marangello to, uh, to introduce our speaker. Hi, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, so you have Sandra Rock's bio on this piece of paper that you all picked up, but um, this is something that we've been working on for quite some time. I've known Sandra through her work with the American Bar Association Business Law Section and the American Law Institute and all sorts of other things. And when I learned that she was a graduate of Susquehanna University, which I know is the alma mater of several of you and is also a, a trustee at Susquehanna, I said, well, if you're coming out to central Pennsylvania, you really ought to come come see us. So I'm delighted that we finally made that happen. Um, Sandra is Counsel Emerita at Cleary Gottlieb Steen and Hamilton in New York. Uh, she is in the New York office. She Her practice focuses on commercial financing. Um, she is active in the firm's fintech practice as one of the principal advisors uh, on commercial law implications uh, of the use of digital assets, probably known to many of you as crypto. Um, recently, she was a member of the drafting committee that recently finalized the new Article 12 of the Uniform Commercial Code um, that governs digital assets. Uh, she's the co-chair of an ABA task force on interme intermediated securities holding infrastructure and 
was involved in the development of the Hague Securities Convention. Now, if you get to do that kind of work and do the international stuff, that's when your meetings are in really cool places. Um, after graduating from Susquehanna, she went to Columbia Law School. Um, and as I said before, is a member of the American Law Institute and a member of the New York State Bar. And I am delighted to, uh, that she is sharing her expertise with us today. So, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Um, and how do I make this go to the next slide? This little thing here? Haha, <laughs> there. I figured it out. See how tech savvy I am? Okay, so I'm not used to being called Sandra by anyone but my mother when she was angry. So usually it's Sandy. All right, so first, the requisite disclaimers. I'm just speaking for myself. You know, you can't attribute anything to my firm, my family members anyone who's ever met me, anyone I've ever represented, the government, anything like that. I'm a product of big law, so what I say is going to be principally focused on rules that have been relevant in my practice. As speaking of my practice, I've never litigated a thing in my life, um, so I cannot talk about litigation rules, and there are many of them that are very interesting. I'm also not addressing unauthorized practice of law or multi-jurisdictional issues. They are fascinating as well, but I don't think that they would be relevant. We're trying to do some basics here with a touch of tech because this is hanging over or illuminating many of the issues that face law commercial lawyers today. So just to note, there's a lot of sources regarding rules that govern lawyers' behavior. So what I'll be referring to when I talk about rules are the ABA model rules of professional conduct. Um, state bars have their own adoptions, and some are more strict, some are more lenient than the ones that we'll talk about. There's the restatement of the law governing lawyers, and there's the restatement of third torts, liability for economic harm, because you can be sued for that, just like any normal human. And there's the restatement third agency that has a lot to say about what you're doing as a representative of your client, who is your principal. Okay, so here's the basics that we're going to talk about today. You have a duty of competence, there's client status issues, there's duty of confidentiality, there are conflict of interest issues, there are communication issues, totally separate from conflict issues, and then a few overarching principles. So let's take a walk through this. One, competence. No surprise, you are expected to be competent when you represent a client. This doesn't mean you have to be an immediate expert in anything, but if, for example, you have spent your entire life working as a professional on trust and estates matters, probably if someone comes to you with an antitrust question, you should think twice before you offer yourself up as competent to discuss that. The consequences can be not pretty. Now, interestingly, as I mentioned, because of the tech issues that are going on today, in a relatively recent comment, and you probably know this, there's black letter law for things and then commentary. And a lot of the information that you'll be deriving from any particular rules, whether they're statutes, regulations, or this area, just as students and then as professionals, you're gonna find the commentary. Sometimes commentary is in case law, sometimes it's published. Here we have some published commentary. And one of the most recent ones is right up here on the screen, which talks about competence means that you have to keep up to date, not just with regular law developments, but also the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. Yeah, I know, see? Engaging continuing study and education and so forth, you know, up until recently, fairly recently, New York didn't have any continuing legal education requirements. <laughs> it's, <clears throat> it's easy to be cynical uh, about that. And people are, and if you eavesdropped on some conversations, even among seasoned professionals, you will hear them talking about getting all their CLE in in one day and there are programs that do that for you. 
And there is no limitation on what the subject matter needs to be. So if you're desperate and you're a commercial lawyer and the program is on tort liability in um, product you know, defect cases, you're watching it and you're getting your CLE. I would just say that it's probably better if you can plan ahead to do some continuing legal education on a field that actually matters or is at least adjacent. Always good to learn a little more broadly than your own area, but it just helps you think better as a lawyer and think a little bit without blinders on. And I myself, I mean, not just because I love school, I always love school, but just to, you always can learn something. You can always learn something, including from the most junior person involved with whatever you're doing, because sometimes newer people ask questions that you kind of glided over, you didn't think about. And it's always good to have an open mind about that stuff and know that you can continue to be educated your whole life and not be cynical about that. Here's the current competence concern about this new technology, right? There's a plethora of, of CLEs now, you know, Professor Moore and Joe and I have been involved in them where lawyers are trying to teach other lawyers. And we also have business people involved, um, people who actually know computer stuff to teach us about what's going on with the new technology, particularly distributed ledger technology, which is the basis for crypto and many other digital assets, right? We have this entire new article of Uniform Commercial Code, first one in how many decades? Decades. Um, article 12, devoted to digital assets, putting in place rules that the market has already been acting like are there, and they haven't been there. And people participating in the market have been at risk for certain behaviors and activities that the commercial law rules are not had not been addressing adequately. So hopefully when you all help get these new laws adopted, we'll be in better shape. Um, all sorts of uh, explosions over the last decades in means of communication, the way you can communicate with thousands of people. And see, I'm old. When I started, there was no, not even any computers, let alone Blackberries, let alone cell phones let alone the things you can do with them that I don't even know, but the opportunities for screwing up are rampant if you're not careful in the technology that you use and clients really, really care about that. Here, so at a recent conference I was at where we were talking about the new rules for digital assets, they, we had this polling question. Have you or your organization entered into any arrangements relating to investments in digital assets? The possible answers were the following. Yes, we do this frequently, small to moderate amount. Not yet, but I look forward to doing so. And no, and I hope this doesn't happen until after I retire. <laughs> By far, hands down, number four, you watch those polling answers come up, right? This little tiny bit, little, little, zoom right across the screen because people are scared to death of this because it, you, it's hard to learn. It's hard to get your mind around if you didn't grow up with it or you're not a coder. Okay, so that's competence. Now here's another one, who's in charge? So you're supposed to abide by a client's decisions concerning the objectives of a representation, right? But you shall not counsel a client to engage or assist a client in conduct that you know is criminal, criminal or fraudulent, but you can discuss the legal consequences of any proposed course of conduct, et cetera. I mean, we do this every day, day in, day out. You could call it tax avoidance. We call it tax optimization, you know, tax planning, something like that. But the idea is that we're constantly trying to help our clients take advantage within the boundaries of the law of interpretive issues, rules, regulations, where the opportunities are for them so that they can maximize whatever they're trying to maximize profits less regulation, um, any of whatever their goals are, but within the realm of not being fraudulent or God forbid, criminal. So this is a fun one. When does someone become a client? A relationship arises when a person manifests their intent that the lawyer provide legal services and either the lawyer manifests right, consent 
or you fail to manifest lack of consent and the lawyer knows or reasonably should know. Reasonably should know is a phrase that shows up all the time. Good luck letting someone interpret what was reasonable for you to have known. You don't want to be in the crosshairs of that question. <clears throat> that the person reasonably relies on you to provide services. So somebody calls you up and starts talking to you and you don't say, wait, wait, I can't represent you until we've gone through all these various hoops that we're going to talk about. And we have various disclaimers and we have various written consents and all that. I can't advise you. You'll see this, we'll talk about it a little more later. Putting that aside, that's the restatement third. In the rules, it says a person who consults with a lawyer about the possibility of forming a client lawyer relationship is a prospective client. And keep that in mind, a prospective client, because that's going to come up later in the rules. There are actual duties to prospective clients. Even if you say, no, you're not going to become my actual client. Okay, who is the actual client? Well, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but an organization is often your client, right? An entity means that entity generally, not its affiliates and not its necessarily individual employees, officers, or directors. It depends on the issue and it depends on the role the officer or director or employee is playing because they can be part of your client. This right here is a key role of engagement letters and law firms in general should, at least in New York, we have to have written engagement letters with our clients that spell out what the scope of our representation may be. And it may be super broad. It may be like, we're gonna represent you in general corporate matters and anything else that you and we decide to engage us for as we go along. Very, very flexible. But the key is you want to identify who the client is because some entities have many, many affiliates and you don't even know where they are or what they're doing. And you don't want to take them on as clients necessarily. You don't without knowing who they are and agreeing to it and getting certain information about them. Okay. Confidentiality. You probably know this already. Oh, I'm warm. This is great. I'm not freezing, which is a good development. So base rule, a lawyer shall not reveal information relating to representation of a client unless the client gives informed consent, impliedly authorized for certain things or permitted by certain exceptions that we're not gonna talk about here. Of course, the person has to have become a client but remember, prospective client, special category, we're going to talk about them later. Attorney client privilege and work product and all that stuff, super cool. Lots of cases about when you put the words privilege and confidential on top of a memo, whether that does anything for you, whether you've shot yourself in the foot. You know, there's lots of fun on that. I'm not dealing with that. And the reference to information is general. You see that information relating to the representation. You cannot even tell someone else you represent someone as your client unless that client says you can. Now, when you want to self-promote, you typically get clients to consent that you can go tell other people, hey, I represent Goldman Sachs. I represent Citibank. I represent, you know, some upstanding public figure or you know, rapper or something, but you need their consent to, to do that, which sometimes comes as a surprise to people. And some clients don't want you to tell anyone that you represent them. Okay, continuing on in that, part of confidentiality is that you will make reasonable efforts. You love the word reasonable. You don't want to be in the crosshairs of that either. Reasonable efforts to prevent the inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure of or unauthorized access to. Are you hearing the echoes of tech um, information relating to the representation of a client? Relatively new, associated with technology. Here's this comment. What's reasonable? Factors include the difficulty of 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 implementation and whether it will 
be very burdensome for you if you have 52 different security measures before you can access you know, a contract of a client or a memo that you're working on. It may be just too burdensome, but there in real life, clients now will send outside counsel guidelines to us saying, these are the security measures we expect you to have in place. I, I shudder to think of the things I used to do that would, I mean, not terrible, but just things like your own printer at home, not okay. I mean, incredibly detailed security measures required by clients and otherwise you're in the reasonable efforts and as I said, you really would rather not have somebody determine that for you after the fact. Okay, former and prospective, member prospective, this is the fun stuff. Okay, a former client, if you formerly represented someone and are no longer their lawyer, meaning your, your engagement has actually terminated, not just that you forgot to think about them as a client anymore or haven't worked with them for several years, um, you will not use or reveal information relating to that, subject to other certain exceptions, but it's best to keep the baseline rule in, in mind. You're not supposed to share information. That's basically it, unless somebody has consented to it. This is fun. Even when no client lawyer rep relationship ensues, so this is prospective client. Remember somebody who came to you and inquired about using your services, and even if you said no, right? Afterwards, they are a prospective client until you're done making clear that you are not their lawyer. A lawyer who has learned information will not use or reveal that information. And this gets people into trouble all the time. And also, by the way, not everyone out there is nice. And people are sometimes very savvy about calling up firms and dumping information on them which will then conflict them out of other representations that they don't want them to take. Not fun. So you wanna be very careful on the intake. Okay. More. Now what? Conflicts. Now you've got a current client. It's not just perspective, not a form. You've got a current client. You cannot represent a client if the representation involves a concurrent conflict of interest, meaning a conflict with another client, if one client representing one client would be directly adverse to the other client, or, or even if just representing one of the clients because of what you have in your head would so compromise your ability to represent the other one. The easiest example, of course, is you're not, you cannot represent one client negotiating with another client over a purchase and sale agreement, or God forbid, a merger agreement, a, a contract negotiation, even if both of them really come to you and say, oh, but this is so friendly. This is friendly. We both want the same thing, and we both like you so much. You're so good at this. Can't you just do this? It could be that if you go through 52 hoops and have like the most airtight, oh, what was like, um, oh, come on, parents of Siri. Come on, um, um, uh, what is he? He's um, the, that religion that's not a religion. Yes. You, there is, there is a way to do it if each client gives informed consent, each client. Well, you have a whole big problem if you have a partner who is not communicating that with you, which is like a whole nother thing. You're talking about a partner in a firm? Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole slew of rules about how firms have to behave and knowledge imputed from one to another which is very problematic if somebody is not telling the other person. Well, it depends on what's going on. So if two clients come to you and say, we trust you and we want you to just document this very simple thing and we're willing to sign informed consent, that is one thing. That is one thing. You could probably navigate that. The problem is that what happens in the case later is there's a dispute and then they, one or the other sues you. Yes. That's a problem. I would recommend not doing it. Not doing the not doing the double representation. Not. What do you do if your partner says that uh, 
they don't recommend you signing a waiver and they recommend you moving forward. Oh, I think that's not a good idea. Yeah, so what do you uh, that is a big problem. Yeah. That is a big problem. <laughs> And that's our slide on 5.1 on um, obligations of junior associates, because yes, you, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not laughing. I'm scared to death. I think that's really, yeah, that's really unfortunate. Um, yes. Well, um, I don't know if you actually have a responsibility to report out to any ethics committee of the Bar Association. I would like to... Let me help you out a little bit. I love the back and forth. Will you be able to stay after? Yeah. Okay. I'm more than willing to stay after. Okay. Thank you. This is a terrific discussion, though, in the gallery. And the worst kind of law school exam question. Yeah, actually. And yet very useful, and nevertheless. Okay. All right. Hold that thought. Also, by the way, you see here, the matter, no matter what, cannot be a litigation or other proceeding. So backing up a step, if it's not a litigation or other proceeding and you have informed consent and the representation doesn't compromise you, your ability to represent both sides, then you could possibly move forward. But to your point, informed consent, and I'm pretty sure it has to be in writing too. Okay, uh, former clients. If you formerly represented someone and, and the uh, matter is over, you can't represent another person in the same or substantially related matter. So there's more room here. There's more room here. You, if it's unrelated, you can go ahead. If there's a former client and you're having a new matter and you're facing that former client, but it's an unrelated matter, so you did a litigation with the former client, but now you're doing some IP work with someone else who's facing, uh, you know, doing a license agreement for some IP, you can do that. <coughs> but of course, the for you can broaden that in a related matter if the client gives informed consent confirmed in writing. But if it's not the same or it's unrelated, there's no restriction. Okay. It's, if it's not the same or substantially related. Okay. Um, oh, <laughs> what happened to this? Oh, I know. See, we went from 1.7 to 1.9. And I just want to mention, I know that I skipped 1.8. 1.8 has a lot of really, really specific rules that are very, very interesting. And when I was giving my first ethics talk with my uh, associates, young associates at the firm, I asked them, is there anything you remember about the model rules of professional conduct. And they said, yes, they remembered one. And I was, that's great. What is it? And it turns out it was 1.8J, which says that you shouldn't have any sexual relations with a client unless you were already having sexual relations with the client before they became a client. So I was greatly heartened by the fact that they remembered something about conflicts. Okay. Conflicts, prospective clients now. Remember, we said prospective clients are going to keep showing up because you know they're not your client. So you will not represent a client with interests materially adverse to those of a prospective client in the same or substantially related matter if you received information from that client that could be significantly harmful to that person in the matter because they're not, they're not a client, right? Partly because what gets in your brain, if you know stuff that that person told you and then representing a client against them, it's very hard not to use that information. So this is a rule to try and protect people who are prospective clients and shared sensitive information with you before you told them that you can't represent them. Again, not everybody is nice and some people give you information you don't want. Okay. 
as applied to law offices, everything is imputed. See, I said, this doesn't matter how junior you are. Seniors have additional responsibility, but also there's a special rule for juniors, 5.2, which I didn't type out here, but we can talk about. Okay. Now, communication issues. This is so much fun. Rule 1.4, you're supposed to keep the client informed about significant developments in the matter, in the representation. You're supposed to consult with them. This will come up later, but this is where cybersecurity comes in, right? You have to keep the client informed and you have to consult with the client and also concerns about cybersecurity. All right, let's do some basics about you try and wanna generate business. Back in my day, you couldn't do any advertising at all. Unseemly, isn't done. Um, but now, no, not true anymore. You can definitely, but you need by any medium, but you cannot make a false or misleading communication about yourself or your services. There are various specific rules, including limitations on compensating endorsers or referral services. And there's specific prohibitions against holding yourself out as some sort of specialist, unless there is in fact an industry type certification for being a specialist and you have it. So I can say I specialize in commercial law, creditors rights, insolvency matters, but I cannot say I am a capital C, you know, commercial, capital L, capital S specialist, not allowed. And then there's definite limitations on solicitation. One of the big exceptions that applies to almost all of, I would say a lot of big law firms for most of what they do is that you're always going to clients, people and making a pitch, right? For business. But if someone asks you to come in and make a pitch, that's fine. Or if that someone is someone who is in the business of hiring lawyers for services of the type you are looking to provide, you're allowed to put yourself out there in, you know, in the face of that cl prospective client and say, hey, you should hire us. We are fabulous at this or that. But unless it's a family member or that kind of situation, because you can bombard friends and family members all the time, um, unless it's that situation, you cannot go out to the general public and be like soliciting business. Okay. Communicating with third parties. All right. Bedrock rule. A lawyer shall not make a false statement of material fact or law to a third person or fail to disclose a material fact when disclosure is necessary to avoid assisting criminal or fraudulent act. This is very, very broad and it's a criminal or fraudulent. Fraudulent is a very fuzzy word, very fuzzy. And so you'll see later, we'll talk a little bit about specific circumstances where you can get caught up in this when you would be like, oh, I didn't commit fraud. And others would be like, well, I beg to differ. So this one is really fun. 4.4b, a lawyer who receives a document or electronically stored information relating to representing representation of that lawyer's client and knows or reasonably should know that the document or electronically stored information was inadvertently sent shall promptly notify the sender. And then mic drop. What happens then? Fascinating set of questions on that one. I'm not giving you the answer yet, but we're going to have a fun little tidbit about that later. Communicating with third parties. Here's no surprise. If you're dealing on behalf of a client with an unrepresented party, you have a basic duty to warn that unrepresented party that you are have an interest in the matter and that they should think about getting counsel. Okay? It's basically a duty to warn them. You should think about it. Um, because they're going to say later that you misled them and they thought you were helping them too and all sorts of nasty things. Communicating with represented, par represented parties is another good rule. It says you will not communicate about the subject of the representation with the person that you know to be represented by another lawyer unless you have the consent of that other lawyer or authorized by law or court order. We don't care about that because that's too narrow. Okay. Let's talk for a minute about some overarching. How are we doing time? Um, 
overarching, some overarching principles. You are an advisor. You're supposed to exercise independent professional judgment, render candid advice, okay? And in rendering that advice, you may refer not only to law, but other considerations, moral, economic, social, political, that may be relevant, okay? That's nice that you have authority to do that, but you're an advisor. You're supposed to be more than just answering a specific teeny tiny little question without any context. You have to have general respect for rights of third parties. And this is where lots of behavior can lead to lawsuits against lawyers because they think that the lawyer has injured them by either not telling them something or telling them something misleading, even though that's not their client and it might not even be the counterpart. There's a whole rule eight series about maintaining the integrity of the profession, including a specific rule on misconduct, not engaging in misconduct. And then reputation, just to state the obvious. It's even if you can do something and even if your own client which is an organization, may have consented to your doing something, let's say on behalf of another client. If you don't navigate or tread carefully, you can end up with having your reputation hurt because that client, someone at that client may feel per personally affronted by the fact that you're involved in something across the table from them. And this is a particular problem where you have big firms and big clients. We had a situation where we followed to the letter getting conflict waivers for a matter. And it was actually very narrow and very small and no problem. The client gave us informed consent. But one person inside the organization who had worked with one person inside our firm, not even the people involved, heard about it and was upset because that person thought of us as their like general outside counsel, even though we're a huge firm, we work for a lot of different people, they're a huge firm. So just, and I'm not saying don't take on the other representation, it was perfectly sensible for us to do it, but the courtesy call goes a long way. If somebody informs their partners in the firm, we're doing this, you might wanna give so-and-so a call just to, to let them know that this is what we're doing. That can go a long way. And that's just interpersonal relations and you just shouldn't leave that at the door. When you start practicing, you should take some sense of appropriate caring behavior to the other humans, even if they are clients and sometimes find them annoying. Okay, now let's have some fun with hypos. Okay. So you represent Midsize Corp, public debt financing. A dispute subsequently develops between Midsize and the trustee about interpretation of certain covenants in the indenture. They ask for your advice. You're reviewing it. Uh-oh, you noticed two mistakes that you made. <laughs> we all make mistakes. It never ends. In drafting the document that may adversely impact midsize's position, do you have to reveal the mistakes to midsize? Hands, yes. Hands, no. Good. You know what that comes under? Candid advice. It doesn't mean when you're necessarily just affirmatively advising the client, you have to be candid with them. Can your firm represent midsize in negotiations or litigation over the dispute? Hands, yes. And no, this is very touchy. This is touchy because you, you have your own interests at heart. You're, you're upset about the mistake. You know it could hurt them. Will you be able to, you might think your interests are aligned. I'm, I'm gonna negotiate even harder for my client because I made the damn mistake and I wanna be sure that I help them you know, win this point in this dispute. Not sure that you will be thinking clearly enough to do that. And it, you might be better served and your client might be better served by handing it off to someone else. I'm not saying there's a definite right or wrong answer here. And I think it's probably very heavily fact specific. And these are simple hypos, but that's the kind of situation you can get in. But I'm really glad everyone was on top of the candor. Okay. 
here's our prospective client typo. CFO of a hedge fund, your firm doesn't represent, calls your office. He lays out his whole aggressive workout idea that he's going to do that's going to push the borrower that's, that he and others are going to get together to file an involuntary position, petition against the borrower, forcing him into bankruptcy, right? After 10 minutes, he gives you this whole thing. He reveals the borrower's identity. And guess what? It's a client of your firm on IP matters. You decline the representation without disclosing why. Can you alert the firm's client of the hedge fund's intentions? Hands, yes. Hands, no. Very good. You cannot do that. Can you represent the firm's client in the workout and in resisting any involuntary petition that is filed? Hands, yes. Hands, no. This, I would lean on the no part because you have in your head their whole strategy and therefore in representing your client and resisting that strategy, you are going to have a hard time not using that information you got to the disadvantage of that prospective client. However, can another lawyer in your firm represent the client in the workout and possible involuntary petition? Hands yes, hands no. I think you can be on the side of yes, as long as you take certain steps and those involve not sharing any of that information at all with your colleagues, which is going to be interesting and, and challenging, right? Because you've got to say to your colleagues, hey, um, I can't work on this, <laughs> but would you like to do it? And then you have to set up systems that screen you make sure you don't sh didn't share any information and that you're not involved. And it goes on to say that you can't get any compensation out of this, but it doesn't really mean you can't get your usual partner draw or associate salary. It really means that if it were something like, let's just say a contingency fee or something like that, you can't be one of the people that, that pulls that in. Um, so that's, that's on that one. Okay, now. When a square becomes a triangle, you're representing a borrower, proposed line of credit, secured by receivables, one of our favorites, <laughs> for various reasons, times of the essence, oh, everybody's on a phone call, we've been there, a la, 90 minutes into it, the bank's counsel announces she has to join another meeting, just hangs up. Your client very much wants you to continue the call. A lending officer from the bank who's on the phone wants you to continue the call and seems not at all unhappy that his counsel has just disappeared. Can you continue the call without them? I should say without him. Hands yes, hands no. That is no, that person you know is represented by counsel, right? So you can't continue. Even if that person says, well, I'm so glad I don't have the clock still running because he was adding nothing to this call. Let's go, let's get this deal done. No, would it matter if the lending officer from the bank were instead in in-house counsel? Hands yes, hands no, no. Because they're represented by counsel. So the client is represented by that outside counsel. The best thing to do in that circumstance, and you hope it works, is to shoot an email to that other lawyer and say, hey, your guy wants to continue this. And I'm, I'm fine with that as long as you tell me it's okay. And usually you'll get it right back. Yeah, go ahead. Just, you know, I'm going to review anything that that you all agreed to. So whatever, they'll say something protective and that'll be fine. But this comes up this comes up and it's very awkward, really very awkward, especially when a lot of times we represent large banks and they have huge inside counsel um, folks. I mean, huge numbers of them. And, you know, sometimes they're represented by outside counsel and sometimes they're not. And you have to navigate which time they are and which time they're not. And, and sometimes up front, you can have a conversation with the other counsel because you know these conversations are going to go on and on. And you can just say, all right, let's just agree that 
unless we say otherwise, if I have to drop from a call, you can, you can continue, or if you have to drop from a call, I can continue. You can set it up, but it's just better not to, and I'm sure people do it all the time, but honored in the breach, right? <coughs> okay. TMI. Okay, you're asked on a highly confidential basis to advise a borrower on whether the borrower may have breached certain covenants under a loan agreement. You did some miscellaneous work for the lender that appears concluded. You leave a voicemail for the partner who handled the work for the lender in which you explain the entire situation and inquire whether the work described on the conflict sheet had been concluded. You get a voicemail back from the same partner the next morning to the effect that the work was not quite over. He had called his contact at the lender, explained the entire situation, and the contact said he would get in touch with the appropriate lending officer to see whether they would consent to the rep representation. Did your helpful partner violate any rule of professional duty? Hands yes, hands no. It's a yes. He went and told another client all this information that you were given that you're not allowed to use or reveal. Did you violate any rule of professional duty? Hands yes, hands no. I think it's probably yes. You shouldn't have told them all that stuff. You should have called and just said, I need to know if that work is concluded. Yes or no. Then when he says it's not quite concluded, then you're gonna have a decision to make about whether you go to the client that asked you to help them and say, may I go tell this other client that you've asked me to represent them? Sometimes they'll be like, hell yeah, let's go. And sometimes they'll be like, absolutely not. I don't want them to know that I'm you know, thinking about whatever I'm thinking about. So best approach is never to share any information until you're absolutely sure that it won't be a violation of confidentiality to anyone. Trying to make rain, here you go. Your firm wants to team with Groupon to offer a special deal on drafting wills. Individuals who purchase the Groupon can get a will for X dollars, which is Y percent off your normal rate. Is this okay? Hands yes, hands no. I think it's yes, I think you can do it. It's a kind of advertise, you're not paying Groupon to refer people to you. It, let's preface this by saying, I have no idea how Groupon works because I really haven't used it. But in the times I've discussed this with other people who understand it, it seems that you are paying, you may be paying for the Groupon some percentage, but you are not paying Groupon to refer people to you. You are not paying them to generate clients. You are going out into the world and suggesting to the world that they will get a discount if they hire you. What if the offer is sent only to people in your town over 65? Is that okay? Hands yes, hands no. I think it's targeted solicitation that is not to friends or family and not to someone who is in the business of hiring services like yours. So I think that that would be in a not so good zone. Okay. Here's a fun one. Partner in your firm proposes to sue a publicly traded company. Your firm does no work for the putative defendant, but you represent a third tier sub. When asked whether your engagement letter with the subsidiary includes the firm's standard, we represent you and none of your affiliates language, you reply, no, I tried to get it, but the GC general counsel struck it. She said she was uncomfortable with it. Can the firm commence litigation against the parent company without the subsidiary's consent? Hands yes, hands no. Be here, technically, when you engage with an organization, you represent only them and none of their affiliates. So in theory, you could do this. In real life, you know this is a mess because it's gonna come out that you asked for this. They said, no, the, the engagement letter is just, is just plain, right? It, you didn't build in 
and I represent all your affiliates and subsidiaries or, and I, you know, can do these things or can't do these things. You didn't say anything, but you have this background back and forth that you know is gonna come out and it's just gonna work totally against you. So you're kind of stuck here. I mean, I think as a technical matter, you might be able to do it, but I think it would be very unwise. That would be my vote. Okay. The gift, I like this one. 11 and a half hour of negotiation Two covenants as the only outstanding point, borrower caves and its counsel advises lender's counsel. Final loan agreement, both marked and unmarked for execution, arrives by messenger from lender's counsel the following morning to your surprise. Uh, this was you in the hypo, not just borrower. But anyway, your surprise, you represent the borrower, reflects only one of the requested covenants that your client reluctantly acceded to. Must you advise your client of its good fortune? Hands yes, hands no. People seem very concerned about this one. Um, and let me, let, let's just finish it and then I'll walk through a few things. Must you advise big banks counsel? That's the bank's counsel. Hands yes, hands no. Okay, in this particular situation, I'll just add a little more color to it. The two covenants, couldn't all fit on the page uh, because this is the subject of a, a bar association uh, informal ethics opinion. Okay, so the additional cover color is that these are two covenants the bank says it always gets in every deal. They've been fighting about it till the 11th and a half hour. Finally, someone's got a blink. The bank's like, you're not getting the money. The borrower caves and then the document comes in with only one of the covenants. In that particular fact pattern, the opinion says, you don't need to tell your client because this is not a development in the matter. And yes, you must advise bank's counsel because if you don't, you, you know you receive something in error. And if you don't, not disclosing it is misleading and possibly fraudulent behavior on your part. Now, you tweak this a little and you get into a much grayer area. What about you're fighting over you know, a net worth covenant or a debt ratio or something like that, and you're arguing, arguing, and you finally agree in principle, because sorry to back up, what this means is you can imagine it, the drafts are flying back and forth, right? Comes in with the two covenants, you strike them, send it back to the bank, the bank's like, no way, puts them back in, comes back over, you're negotiating, you're like, no, I'm never agreeing to this. Bank's like, we always get this. You strike it, send it back. Then when you finally cave, you expect that it's gonna come back the way it had shown up on your desk three times already, right? And it doesn't. So that's, that's a very particular fact pattern, right? But let's just say you're fighting over a debt ratio or a net worth covenant or something like that. And you agree in principle. And the thing comes across and there's some kind of, the way they did the math, you're like, wow, that's a lot less restrictive than I thought. I don't think that means what they think it means. Do you have to tell them? No, no. You don't have to do their math for them. You don't have to do their representation for them. You're not your brother's keeper in that respect. But when it's something that was actually already agreed to, really, then you can't take advantage of somebody's mistake. It was clearly a mistake. So yeah, and there's a whole opinion on that. And then Maryland wrote lots of back and forth and talked about um, other fact patterns where it got murkier and you didn't have these same duties. Okay, this is fun. You'll never have this in your life. You're trying to be available from anywhere. You're working on highly sensitive matter. It doesn't really matter if it's highly sensitive, but You've got lots and lots of very confidential client information. Really, all client information is confidential, but this was making it salacious. Um, everything stored on the firm's encrypted servers go firm because you have an obligation, remember, to prevent the inadvertent sharing or you know disclosure of information. Um, got it on. She's got it on her personal laptop and an unencrypted thumb drive. Lawyer connects her personal laptop to her home unencrypted wireless network and 
at her local coffee shop. To facilitate work on weekends, the lawyer BCCs her personal Gmail account on all messages. Anything wrong here? Hands yes. <laughs> That's, see, it's getting late and I know I'm standing between you, no, between me and adult <laughs> beverages. So this is an easy one. Yes, this is very wrong. This is not a good idea, not a good idea. And, and the, the hypo this came from actually also had her losing the thumb drive and replacing it. And that was a little funkier because it was more like, well, you can carry papers around your briefcase and if God forbid you leave your briefcase on the conveyor belt at the airport, I mean, you're really not going to be prosecuted over that, but it's you have to be careful. But logging into stuff, and I remember being lectured at the firm, it was lecture. They were like, we know who you are, because in the early days, we didn't have such sophisticated arrangements, and we actually didn't even have a way to print a document at home unless we forwarded it to our Gmail account and then printed it, which, of course, now I realize, oh, my God, I should never have done that. But um, you were trying desperately to get something turned around and done quickly for your client and for the firm and not uh, being as sensitive as you should to the fact that something could get disclosed. And there are cases out there really where people get in major, major trouble by ha having other folks have access to sensitive information. I mean, it doesn't usually come up in a case where, oh, the 15th draft of a loan agreement, you know, red line got released, oh my gosh but where there's a merger or a public acquisition or a securities offering or something like that in the works, disclosure documents, you really, really wanna be careful with that. Okay, that was back to the reasonable efforts to make sure that stuff isn't, okay. I wonder if reading this, and I'll ask anybody to shout out if they know where I got this from. Ripped from the headlines, counsel for the, yeah, there you go. Alex Jones. We're not allowed to talk politics. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Anyway, his lawyer, oops, mega amounts of data, mega. Sent over to the counsel for the plaintiffs. Okay, does the plaintiff's lawyer have any responsibility here? Hands yes, hands no. Definite yes, come on ladies and gentlemen. Yes, 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 they know it was sent in error. What do they have to do? Notify the sender. And then as I said, now what? Well, you gotta look at your local state rules. In Texas, there's a rule called the snapback rule which the sender has a right to snap back the information and then the recipient cannot use it. Well, what happened in this case? The plaintiff's lawyer did their duty. They told the sender, hey, <laughs> thanks for, <laughs> thanks for that. He didn't say it that way. He was very respectful and said, probably said, I think you sent this in error. And, uh, and, then uh, the sender said, oh, yeah, wrong file or something, we'll, we'll get you the right one. Didn't ask for anything back, never sent the right one. The 10 days or 20, I can't remember, 10 days, I think, lapsed and plaintiff's lawyer used it on their cross. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I really... I. I mean, low hanging fruit. I really, really kind of wondered if that was a real mistake. I mean, the guy perjured himself up, down and center and the lawyer is representing him while he's perjuring himself. So you've got to be, you can't be counseling your guy to be saying never texted, no phone messages or emails about this. Nope, never, never. And then, you can imagine how many, right? So I don't know. I just think that there's going to be a lot going on involving the defendant's lawyers coming down the pike, and we'll have lots of material to work with, I think, in coming days. I feel, we'll use I words. Okay. Now, here, a law firm represents lots of plaintiffs. You got a group of plaintiffs, right? They're suing a company for environmental contamination. 
firm creates a Facebook group for the, again, I don't use Facebook, so I don't know what I'm talking about, but they do that thing for the plaintiffs and other neighbors where they can get together and share stories and updates and so forth like that. Has the firm done anything wrong? Hands yes, hands no. It's a yes, because this has allowed information to circulate about the representation and about the matter to people, first of all, across plaintiffs may not be the problem, but allowing third parties in there for sure. And Facebook is not exactly, I mean, I don't know what kind of security they might've had on that, but whatever. Now it gets better. A lawyer at the firm representing the defendant <laughs> joins the group posing as a neighbor. Has the lawyer violated the rules? Hands yes? Yes. I'm not even gonna give anybody a no chance because they're lying, they're being an imposter. And plus on top of it, and plus, they could be communicating with people who are not represented by counsel. They're also communicating maybe with people represented by counsel without telling the count. I mean, they've just made a mess for themselves. And we would never do that. Okay. Yes. It doesn't say clearly that the firm was feeding updates, but it allowed the people on the Facebook group. Now, if, if the law firm was part of the Facebook group, which I could see implying in here, which I didn't really make that distinction, but I, then for sure, because then they're divulging information. And then you could argue, well, maybe, and all these things are so much fun to argue about. Maybe you could argue then, oh, but by joining the Facebook group, the clients have given their informed consent to sharing this information, you know, among the group, including other neighbors who are not even part of it. I mean, you could, you could argue that. I think it's kind of more about that the whole Facebook, you know, milieu is not secure in any way really deeply and that you shouldn't be putting people in a position to be sharing information like that. <clears throat> but the big problem really is the other guy coming in. See, he, he it just let anybody could come in. Hey, I'm a neighbor too. So reasonable efforts not to reveal information to third parties definitely doesn't seem like reasonable effort. Maybe if they were able, and I don't know how you would do this on Facebook, but if you were able to limit very clearly, you know, have hurdles to get into that group with certification that you were in fact a neighbor, better if you were in fact a plaintiff, you know, and not just a neighbor, but you could probably do things that would make it less problematic. But the way they did it, that let just anybody walk in, you know, they kind of, even if they weren't part of it, they led their client down the path of, of sharing stuff that, so the, the lawyer facilitated the sharing of information that shouldn't be shared without informed written consent. Right. Okay, so here's somebody um, with a couple, I think this is, oh, three different types of technology. So we got Facebook, she's so bored, sitting in this trial, OMG, the witness made the guys look like total creeps, that's on Twitter, it's a different thing. And then she has a personal blog. I'm in the middle of the trial. This judge is a total loser. Is this okay? Is any of this okay? Hands yes. Hands no. No, no, clearly. I mean, it's 1.6 all over the place. You're not even supposed to let people know that you're representing a client at all, okay, without their informed consent. Okay, let's say this informed consent. The, the, first, the first one is, up until gotta go, probably like if you had informed consent, maybe company B won it. You could argue, oh, well, that's public information, right? It's a public ruling. You know, maybe, maybe you don't want to be defending your actions based on, oh, it's public. Um, the guys made company B look like total creeps. Now that's getting more into the weeds of what's going on there. And it's a proceeding and you shouldn't be doing that. And then on top of it, criticizing a judge in this way, you could argue that violates one of the rules in part eight, which is the general maintaining the integrity of the profession. There's special rules about not assailing the qualifications of a judge. 
or another, you know, judicial participant. So, I mean, maybe you're not saying he's not qualified to be a judge, but saying he's a total loser, just like you're open to interpretation, I think. I don't think you would be saying, oh, what I meant was he was a total loser at a party. So, you know, not okay. Hmm? Amber, yes. We have the people um, up until six, and so I'd like to do a regular to give uh, kind of a round of applause. Thank you. And that would encourage you to, to join us in the gallery for uh, up and after this. That would be great. What you have to see is trending. If you're unfairly trashed on social media, don't respond. And crypto versus cash. There is really an ethical concern here, and it may not be what you think, but part of it is that crypto is property. And if you've taken it in as a retainer, you have to safe keep it. That's fun. Anyway, you've been a really great audience. Thank you for participating. This one. Oh, shit.